This is the Stay Healthy Experience, hosted by Robert Ferguson, Barbara Chris, and Mr. Daniel Baldwin. Uh, today is going to be a great day because one, I'm gonna gain some knowledge and insight about a topic that I have absolutely no knowledge about. Uh, <laughs> but I'm extremely curious, um, and I believe this will be quite beneficial for anyone who listens in uh, because relationships are a big part of health. Love is a big part of health. And so today, our guest is Lori Ellington. So as, as I mentioned, Lori, if I miss, forget anything, because your background, your bio is, is quite heavy, uh, but I know that you're an intimacy coach. To me, I see you, you're like a life coach. You're gonna share insight on all of this and you make your services available to people who are interested in, I guess, maximizing their relationships, whatever that may be. Would that be yeah. correct? That would be correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, as I hand it over to Daniel and Barbara, uh, <laughs> Daniel is very like well traveled and very well learned, and you know he just knows a lot. And Daniel and I haven't talked about this at all, but I'm I'm very oh, intrigued to, to find out how much Daniel knows about the poly um, uh, amorous uh, ways or lifestyle. Uh, Daniel, do you have any knowledge of, of this at, at all before we jump into it? Um, I have <clears throat> a limited knowledge. Um, I believe that no one application works in relationships. I believe that um, there's so many factors behind um, what makes, uh, what are the ins and outs of a successful relationship. I will say that over my years, what I've learned to be the two most important things in successful relationships are number one, communication, and number two, being open. So those two things are the common thread in all relationships in my life for them to be successful. That's what I've learned through my 59 years. All right, Barbara. I know Barbara stayed up all night, Daniel, excited about this kind of <clears throat> <laughs> I was like, ooh, -hoo. no, actually, I don't, I don't know much. I don't know much about, about this topic. Um, I, I think the one thing that I do know is that there's, you know, polyamorous versus polygamy or polygamy is they're different. And, um, but I'm, you know, I'm willing or I, I'm anxious to learn more about it. Um, it's not necessarily, I think, a fit for me, but, um, uh, I think it's good to be open-minded to learn more about how what other things work for other people. Okay, well, I don't know why you would say is you don't you you don't know much about it and it's not a fit for you before having this conversation. But well, we'll, we'll see. Let's see if Barbara has a change of, of tune. So, Laura, okay. I think that's it. I think, I think, it, I think it's because Barbara's a player. That's what. <laughs> Barbara's a player. She's not gonna limit herself. This is a woman of the world. That's right. That is right. Let's go, D-Money. All right, Lori. So, Lori, give us a background on you. How did you get here? What's, what's the background story? This is exciting. I'm just feeling the energy of the group, and I really like it. So thanks so much for inviting me on. Like, right now, I feel completely satisfied. Um, so, yeah, so I've been practicing ethical non-monogamy, um, also known, well, there's a couple different ways. Like, ethical non-monogamy is, like, an umbrella, and then there could be, polyamory, there could be open relationship, there could be monogamish, there could be swinging, and lots of other different variations. So the umbrella is ethical non-monogamy. So I've been practicing what I would call polyamory for about almost eight years. And um, my experience in that is um, that I have the freedom to be able to be in different kinds of relationships based on what my needs, wants, and desires are and how they relate with other people. And so what got me to where I am now is that I would say 10 years ago or 12 years ago, I was in one of those relationships that was the worst relationship that you're supposed to be in. All the red flags, I decided to make clothing out of them because I was just in this place of illusion and this was the best thing you know, in the world. And I got burned and I got really burned bad. And so at that point, this was about, you know, like 10 years ago, I was in this place of like, I'm ready to change my relationship to relationship. And I didn't really know what that looked like. 
And so then I met up with a friend of mine. We'd been friends for eight years prior. And he said, you know, wow, well, I'm polyamorous. And that means that I'm always going to have another girlfriend. And like, he just started to talk about all of these different new things that I had never heard of before. And I said, wow, like you can do that. And so he and I developed a relationship that it's that, that for seven years was like a primary relationship. So he and I lived together and we worked together and we were kind of a home base together. And so we had each other's backs and we just sort of merged lives together, but we also had the freedom or the ability or the willingness and the support to explore other connections outside of our primary connection. And because what was most important to us was communication and presence and connection and transparency, we were able to do that in a very functional way. And so as I continued to explore in that lifestyle, I was also like involved in a coaching program. People in our community were beginning to look at us and ask us questions. Well, how do you do that? And like, can you do that and be happy? Like, cause so many people that are doing this, you know, non-monogamous thing, they end up with all of this drama. And so my partner and I did it very successfully and I would involve myself in all these different kinds of conversations bringing in that piece of communication, that piece of transparency, that piece of connection, and that piece of presence. And then, you know, in another year or so, I merged the two, and now I'm a poly coach. So I focus on, you know, yes, I'm a life coach and a relationship coach and an intimacy coach, but I also do a lot of my primary, like, marketing and focus on ethical non-monogamy because those people are the ones that need a lot of help because there's not many professionals out there that really have walked through the fire to be able to say, hey, I know what jealousy is, or I know what you know, lack of communication is, or I know what infidelity is. Like, I know a lot of different things because I've worked with a lot of different people and I've walked through different fires. So I'm able to bring that to my practice and it's, it's pretty interesting. Wow, I mean, there, that's, yeah. there's a lot of information there. Yeah, um, there was a lot of information there. Thanks for listening. And, and- <laughs> In preparation for um, this interview and this conversation, I went into, we have a, a, a private Facebook group. And in that private Facebook group, um, I posed a question about, you know, I keep getting the words, they're all, I'm just all mumbled up, like polyamorous. And some people got really upset mm-hmm. and I like, started pointing fingers and started, you know, got to this place where they were like, this doesn't make sense. I'm totally against it. Mm-hmm. Share, I mean, I'm sure you, you experience that all the time. Plus, you're in this, the beautiful state of Texas, right? So in Texas, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of Bible belts. So how, how, do, you, how do you work around that? <laughs> so first of all, I'm in Austin, and they say the only problem with Austin is that it's surrounded by Texas. So like, I'm kind of an oasis, and it's kind of beautiful, and I love Austin, and I love Texas. So, But yes, there's a lot of conservative around here. And I think... Um, yeah, there are a lot of people that just, it's not their thing. Um, now whether it's not their thing because they're programmed to believe that it's not an option. So they, and they already have a judgment about it. Um, there's a lot of people that think that and totally fine. Like I'm not here to, you know, convince anyone that they need to do things differently. Um, I think people who are in the lifestyle are known for themselves that there's something more than what society has pulled them and so they're wanting to explore that and there are people like all over the spectrum that are like I'm going to explore this and it's going to be my way and they make messes left right and center and then there's other people that are cautiously approaching you know it's kind of like cautiously approaching the room and knocking on the door and opening the door and saying wow like what's in this room and how can we do this in a healthy and sustainable way so yeah I get that there's a lot of people that aren't in favor or understand or want to know anything about it like and that's okay and there's also people that want that so that's okay too okay well <laughs> well we have a lot of questions so i'm a let me go through some of the questions because there was a lot sure. of that was that was positive and then we'll all, all right. kind of talk about each one and the goal at least for me is that you can bring clarity to what it really is about right because i do have a uh, one of my friends who's a celebrity uh by the name of monique she won an academy award a movie called Precious. Her and her husband have an open relationship. Mm-hmm. And my time around them, they totally love each other. And I see a love between the two of them 
that you don't see with a lot of couples. And I don't know all the details of their constitution as far as the rules they have in place, but it looks as though they have an extremely healthy relationship. So that being said, um, Nicole uh, posed a question. She says, how do, and she's talking about couples, how do they not get jealous or feel guilty when they have this kind of relationship? Can you, can you start there? No, absolutely. So first of all, people will feel jealous and people will feel guilty. So it's not about trying to avoid the feelings. It's about how to be with certain feelings that are uncomfortable and learning how to navigate that. Because regardless of whatever kind of relationship you're in, you're always going to have a feeling. So feelings are normal. It's a part of being human. And so to be able to say, oh, I'm having this experience that might be called jealousy, you know, it's like, yeah, like that's common. And in my world, feelings are okay. It's just what we do with those family feelings that can create more connection or more disconnection. And so when people are able to acknowledge what they're feeling and they're able to bring that to the table and then their partner or partners are able to welcome that rather than judge it and say, you're a bad person because you're feeling jealous. It's like, no, 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 like that's not what it's about. It's like, what is most real and how can we be our most authentic versions of ourselves and bring that to the world and that to the relationship. And then that's where all the magic is. And it's difficult, but it's powerful. So to kind of like to, I guess, carry on with that question a little bit more. So let's say mm -hmm. you, you have this couple and one of them brings, let's say they're jealous about something. They bring it to the table, like you said, and mm -hmm. they're, they're facing those feelings and they're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you dealt with couples that maybe they do that and maybe for one of the participants in the relationship still doesn't sit well, even though they've talked about it, they, they bring it to the table and it still doesn't sit well with them. I mean, mm -hmm. I would imagine that happens quite a bit that maybe someone tries to do it and it just doesn't, it just doesn't mm -hmm. fit, you know? Yeah. How do you, absolutely. How do you navigate that? Yeah. It's really interesting because again, it's like when I work with people, like I try to stay away from the goals and I try to focus on what's happening in the moment. And like in that I'm aware too, that there are some people that are viscerally monogamous. Like it's just like, it's in their bones. It's who they are. They don't want to change. And then there are people that are viscerally polyamorous or viscerally like wanting to explore. It's in their bones. They don't want to change and they don't want to feel limited. Right. So you have these two people that are in relationship and all of a sudden maybe they've been in partnership for a number of years and then the light goes off and, it's like, hey, I'm poly. and you're like, oh shoot, I'm not poly. So you have this one that wants to explore and this other one that's freaking out. And so, you know, and there are some people that cognitively, will understand the concept of like, okay, it makes sense that people can love more than one person. And in my body, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to register those feelings. I don't know how to have those conversations. I certainly know, don't know how to be in partnership with someone. So then it's kind of like, okay, like are you curious enough to try? And if so, we can go somewhere with that. Or are you, you know, just, like, is it done? Is it a deal breaker for you? So I, I get in conversations with people where we begin to flush out what's most important to them, like as individuals and their values, and then also as partners and what they want to do in partnership and how they want that partnership to evolve over time. Because it may mean that they stay together and they kind of work some of this stuff out. It may mean that just like, no, like we need to have a conversation about doing some conscious uncoupling and then they do that. Like it really is an evolution. And I think that's what I am most drawn to about my life choices is that my life is continuously evolving and it's never the same year to year, but it's evolving and I feel very alive in that. So. It's so interesting. I mean, I, I, a lot that you shared though. I mean, a lot that you shared, I feel like that translates to, like you said, really all relationships, mm -hmm. that skill set. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you know. I have, I have a close friend that she said, I want to write a book and I want to say everything I need to know about monogamy. I'm a friend. 
-hmm. You know, just like in terms of communication and in terms of the skill set, because many people, when they get in relationship, and I'm not judging like any kind of relationship, it's like we get comfortable. You know, even in my previous seven years with my partner, like we got comfortable. And when you get comfortable, you don't always like stretch out or take risks. And then parts of us shut down. And so it's just like, it's natural and you know, it's good to kind of bring some more life into it. All right. How, how, often, how often do you get someone who is highly religious uh, mm -hmm. in public, but yet they get with you as a coach <laughs> and with their, their spouse or whoever the and they actually have this going on behind closed doors uh -huh. it's, it's it is common actually you know and in those like in those situations i get the phone call they're like okay this is our background and they like go you know down the list and who they can talk to and it's more like who they can't talk to because the majority of their life and their people like they can't talk to anybody and either they've left the church or they're wanting to leave the church, or they just know that it's not for them, they call me because they know that, like, I'm at least going to be able to have a conversation with them without judging them, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I do get that. <clears throat> I get that a lot. So judgment, yeah. that's, that seems like a, a big deal. Okay, so I'm mm -hmm. going to go to the question from Pamela. Mm -hmm. Pamela asks, how do you adjust your time between two or more relationships and not okay. feel burnt out? That's a good question. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and that's another, that's a really good question because they say, like, they say love is not limited, but time is. So one of the biggest like, conflicts for people that are like trying to live this lifestyle is like, how do you manage everything? And I get it. Yeah. So I think it's, it's an, it's, it's like every person's going to say a different question depending on who they are. I know for myself, um, I currently have, two partners. One is a woman and one is a male. And um, I see one partner more, mostly because of COVID. Um, I'm still in connection with my other. So it's like I'm in connection with both. However, I see one more because of the pandemic that's happening. Um, so I think, you know, for people who are, and I'm not right now, I'm not in a closed relationship, meaning I'm not living with a partner. Um, when I was living with a partner, it was a little more challenging because we would have our living time together and then each one of us would kind of have to schedule our, you know, time with others. And it gets a little chaotic sometimes. Um, and we just kind of talk it through, you know, there are some people that, um, I don't know, like, yeah, that is a really hard question to answer. And I know that the answer comes with communication around what feels good for everybody involved so that everybody is has a say in what they want. Um, they might not always get what they want, but at least everybody is bringing their voice to the table. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, that just, just that right. burnout. it is, yeah. Well, I guess any relationship is a lot of work, but it's, yeah. it, it's one of those things where I guess it would, it would be really helpful to understand the rules, right? Because I had a conversation with someone once and they were explaining to me, they says, Robert, it's all about the rules and respecting the rules and then the relationship is amazing. Do you help people create that constitution so that, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like how do, I mean, and this oh, yeah. can help all relationships, but it just seems like a lot of work, but I guess if there's rules, Share with us how you can make it work, like the ease of it. Right. right, for sure. So first of all, like when people hear the word rule, lots of times they're like, Ooh, like they just don't like it, you know? And so I try to use like agreement. You know, I try to use the word like agreement or boundaries or something where both people or everybody involved feels comfortable with their yes. Right, because we're looking for yes, yes, or win-win situations, or win-win-win situations, depending on how many people. So, for example, like if there's a primary partnership, like say there's a couple and they're wanting to open their relationship or open their marriage. So first of all, like it's really important that they have a conversation about what their needs are, you know, and what will feel comfortable for them moving forward. And so yeah, there are certain conversations that need to happen. You know, for example, you know, 
who are you interested in what that might look like? Like, what are you interested in? Like, what are your desires with this person or with this exploration? You know, you have to make sure you have conversations or rules around, um, you know, safe sex practices. Then there's timing. Like, when are you going to be going out and seeing that person? And when are you going to be coming back? And so, like, you have to have different kinds. I like to call them containers. Like, setting up little containers so that everybody that's in the 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 relationship or in the container feels relatively safe um so yeah so you know an agreement around you know how often someone's going to see somebody else an agreement around making sure that you have those kinds of safer sex conversations or you know safer covid like pandemic conversations like things that feel important to people need to be talked about and if they're talked about then they can be addressed with other partners Lots of times people will get in conversations and two people will leave the conversation with completely different understandings. And that's where trouble starts. Man, you mentioned COVID. That's scary. What'd you what? say? When you, you just so, mentioned COVID, <clears throat> that, that made me a little nervous. I mean, how Exactly. So I, I, I have a question. I yes. Have a question so using you as the example, because you shared that you have one um, uh, partner that, uh, that's the same sex and one that's not and one because of COVID you, you actually spend more time with right now. But are mm -hmm. you in love with both? And if so, um, how do you share your love um, with two different people? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated at how from a love standpoint that you right. pull that. That's a great question. I do feel love for both of them and it's very different. And it's hard to really explain. I don't have kids, so I can't say, well, I have two children. and I love my children the same, but I love them differently. Um, but I do, yeah, it took me a while like, to get to a place where I actually felt like I could viscerally like love two or three people. And it's, it's interesting because I feel like, I sh like different parts of me show up with different people. And so, for example, my male partner, like there's a different part of me or a set of parts of me that shows up with him and with my girlfriend, a whole different set. And so they're not in conflict. It's actually more of a compliment. And that has taken me a number of years to actually feel in my body that that's possible. Because I think some people will go into it saying, oh yeah, I can love more than one person. Or, you know, they're in a relationship and one's positive that they can love more than one person. But then, like, it's one thing to say it and understand it. And it's another thing to actually, like, journey into that and then get to a place of being like, oh, I'm in love with more than one person. That's really cool. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I should rephrase. I love my dog and I love my children and I love mm -hmm. my mother. But I'm not mm -hmm. in love with either of them. So oh, are, you, so are you in love with either of your partners? I think I am. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there's, a little, there's a little pause there. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to dig now. <laughs> Here's, the thing. Here's, the thing. Here's the thing that I learned is like when someone asks me a question, I want to make sure that the question goes in before I answer it. And so I can say, oh, absolutely. And people would be like, she's not telling the truth. Oh. Or like, I could say, no, never. And like, she's not telling the truth. So I'm just like, I want to sit with it and be like, and I could, and I imagine, like, when you ask that, I imagine myself with my girlfriend and be like, oh, yeah, totally. Like, I'm totally in love with her. And then I imagine my, my male partner, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm totally in love with him. And then I imagine them together. I'm like, whoa, like, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so then take that, take that one more level. So if you're in love with both, is it more um, is it more difficult to be this relationship with two men or two women? If they're the same sex, does that make it more complicated? That yeah, I think it does because dun, 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 dun. yeah, I think I, I and, got some. I think it does. Sorry, drop myself. I think it does because there's a level of threat there. I think like primal threat yeah. that gets in the way for sure. And when I was in a two male, one female um, relationship, like, you know, whatever, like when that was my reality, it was difficult for the males. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. just about to say that. That was, that was a good point, Daniel. Like if it was two males or two females, yeah. that level of competition, I think just naturally would come, would yeah. come up. 
you know, and you want to be yeah. like, I want to outdo her or, you know, whoever. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to like, I don't, not to make light of it, but I, I think just how, you know, how that could feel as far as, and you kind of put it out there as far as you show up as a different, or each person brings out a different things in you. And yeah. it almost feel like, gosh, well, why can't I bring out that in her too? You know, then what am I, what am I missing? Yeah. What do I need yeah. to, what do I need to step up, you know? And yeah. that, and that can maybe, maybe create competition. I don't know. It creates a lot. And I think that's where we need to go really slow and like treat it like delicately. Because when I was in that like two male scenario, like one male was having a really difficult time. And so it's like, how do I like still be in, you know, my, my yes with both of them, but one of them was having a difficult time. And I also know when I was living with a male partner and he was seeing other female partners and I wasn't at the time, I was having a difficult time um, because it's those thoughts of, well, I'm not good enough. Like who, like what, 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 what am I not doing? You know, all of these different like thoughts that will naturally come up, come up. And so that's where that inner work, that like self-awareness of like, okay, this is coming up for me and like, what do I need? Like, is this working? Can I have a conversation about this challenging emotion? And how do I do that? And so okay, with so that, my partner and I did a lot of like work to kind of navigate through some of that challenging emotional stuff. What were you gonna say? So, so what if you're like Robert? What if you're in a nine female rotation? What if you just, you know, there's multiple <laughs> languages you have to communicate with. You know, there's many countries and cities you're dealing with. You know, what, what happens with that? I mean, what's the limit? Is Robert over the top with nine women in a rotation? <laughs> I mean, that depends. I mean, Robert, I think you need to speak to that. What do you say? Uh, I can't I, speak Hey, you know what? That is not me. So. <laughs> oh, no. You didn't just not tell this. It's about open, honest communication, Robert. No. Hey, but but as, as you were talking, I was thinking, <laughs> were you when you were like growing up as a kid, what was your relationship with God or religion? I'm just curious, like and and, and if you had yeah, and if you had a relationship or have a relationship with God, when you brought in this lifestyle, how did your family and friends react? And, you know, mm -hmm. how have you been able to make it work if you have like a religious type of you know relationship? I, I didn't grow up with a very like um hard edged religious that wasn't my grow. That wasn't my upbringing. Um, church was. We did go to church on Sundays. Um, it was got like as I got into my teens and even middle school and teens, I was the youngest of three, so it became more optional. Um, and so it was never like a driving force for how our family was brought up or how relationship was supposed to be. I'm shocked. Um, really. <laughs> I think he's being sarcastic. <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm shocked that Jesus Christ is not a giant there. influence on your life. Right right. Shocked. <laughs> but I'll keep in mind, I, it's it's been eight years. Like I turned fifty in June, so like it's been eight years. Like it wasn't until my forties that I just woke up this part of me and said, "Oh my gosh, you can do that! I want to try. Like why not? Like let's explore this." And so. You know, I'm still a relative baby in the in this situation, but it's fun. So since you coach relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a, a couple, man and woman, they've been married for 20, 25 years. They mm -hmm. come to you for life coaching, right? For their mm -hmm. relationship. Do mm -hmm. you ever suggest that they should maybe consider opening up to save their relationship, to go into that lifestyle? Um, so, I've never done that. Um, like I've never, so I'm trying to think back to see if I've ever actually done that. Lots of times when couples come to me, it's more like what the, what the needs are. And so I go down the rabbit hole with each of them individually and the unit. And if they discover in their journey of like what their needs and values are, and they said, wow, actually like, I read this thing, or this is something that I'm interested in. I was like, okay, yeah, like that's a thing. And let me tell you about that thing. And if that's something that the two of you want to explore, then there's a way to do that. And I'd love to help you on that journey. Wow. So I don't try to convert people. Right. <clears throat> All right, let me go to a but quick question. 
So we have a question from Amanda. Amanda says, do they look for partners together, like go to the bar where they agree mm -hmm. on another man and woman for each? Also, if say the man sees a girl at a coffee shop, he goes to a lot, uh, he goes to a coffee shop a lot, and he's interested in, does he have to go home and ask his spouse first before asking the girl for her number? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Like yeah, that's, called, that's, called, that's called the mocha before the poker rule. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> You, you, met, you met her at the coffee shop. You have to ask permission. That's the mocha before the poker. Come on now. Take a deep breath. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh my god. Okay, so two part question. So first part, do they go and look together? Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. It really depends on what desire. For a couple that's new and interested in like, doing it together and seeing if it works together, then, you know, going to a bar, going to a lifestyle club, going to an event where they're able to sort of get their feet wet and see what that's like, I think is really helpful. And then they can have conversations afterwards about what that looks like and what they want to do. So it's sort of like every. With the coffee shop scenario, the mocha for the put before the polka. Um, I think, um, yeah, like I think sometimes people feel an urgency to get like to get their foot in the door, like to really like get like to 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 get that number because that might be the only time they get a number. Um, and I often caution people from like operating out of urgency because yes, you're go you want that. But are you doing it in service to the long-term goal, which is to see what this lifestyle or this, yeah, this lifestyle, this relationship style might look like in support of your current relationship? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much going home and asking permission. It's more going home and saying, wow, like we talked about this open relationship thing and there's this, there's this hot chick at the coffee shop that I see and I'm interested in getting to know her. What would that be like for you? So rather than going, oh my God, I got to get the number and then explain to your spouse later. It's like, no, it's like, wow, I see you. I'm interested in you. And I'm going to have a conversation with my wife and just see where we are at with the exploration and see when we're ready to do that. Wow. I mean, I can't even imagine that, Daniel. You and I go <laughs> no. into the coffee right. store. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm trying to imagine. I'm, I I finally fulfilled my fantasy of being married to Barbara, and I pick up my cell phone and I say, I say, baby, I'm at Starbucks. I mean Starbucks, and I have an opportunity here that you know I'm. Re I know we talked about it, but you know, I just. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't, right. I can't see it. Yeah, not, I have it's, Italian it's, too. It's, it's not for me, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not for me. Here's, what, and then here's something that we often tell people like to avoid, like avoid making the phone call to your spouse as you're driving to the other person's house saying, hey, I met this person and I'm going to take them out for coffee. Like, no, 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 no. You want to make sure that you have the conversation. There's, a great, there's a, great, a, a great scenario happened to me. I walked in. I'm going to have to be careful how I say this. How careful do I have to be about how graphic I'm being, Robert? on the show. Do I have to be very careful? Well, we haven't been uh, kicked off of YouTube or anything yet, so. All right, well, I'll try, I'll, try to, I'll, try to, I'll try to word this carefully. So I walk into the Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto, and as I walk by, I'm shooting a, t a movie. It's late. It's probably 10 o'clock at night, and standing at the counter is my brother, Alec. And I look over and I go, hey. And he looks back at me and he goes, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing here? So at that moment, a very tall, I, I mean, 10 out of 10, beautiful girl, had to be a model. She was probably six feet tall. And she walks right up to Alec and noticing him and she starts talking. So I walk over and she's absolutely working. She's got the tiny little dress on, no bra, the boobs are shooting out through the outfit and she's a 10. So finally, you know, he's kind of looking, looking at her like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was married to Kim Basinger at the time. 
And I, you know, I'm shooting a movie. What are you doing? How could you come to town and not tell me? Yada, yada. We get to go in the elevator and she's walking right next to him. And finally he looks at her and he says, I I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. And she goes, you know, I could come up with you if you want. And he looked her right in the eye and he went, no, I'm sorry. I'm married. That's all right. So we get on the elevator. It's just he and I. And I said to him, God, that must be really hard. I mean, when you're that big a movie star, women that pretty just throw themselves at you. And he goes, it's really easy for me. I close my eyes. I imagine my wife on her knees with somebody else's blank in her mouth. He said, and that shuts it all down for me right away. He said, it shuts it down for me. He goes, because the idea that my wife would be with someone else is enough to sober me out of that experience every single time. And so... I, th I think you just have to be made up differently, you know, to, for, for that to be okay with you. You know what I mean? Uh, for you to go home knowing that your partner's on his way over or her, she's on her way over, to have sex with another person when, for me, that's something that I would, especially if I'm married to them, I would want to be sacred. You know what I mean? I, I, I would not want to have my partner share that. I think my fear of my partner sharing it overwhelms me more than my my fear of my sharing it with someone I, I think for me yeah yeah i feel that i feel that too well see but i remember in the very beginning you know um you you made it very clear that not everyone is not it's not part of who they are innately and then some people it is part because i you know you see couples where they end up having affairs they start to you know mess around because they're different that way um mm -hmm. But that being said, someone posted a question that kind of is in alignment with, with uh, what, what Daniel was just saying. Uh, BK, uh, Bonnie, she says, no matter what you call it or how you try to spin it, it's adultery. What's your thoughts when someone is really quick? I'm sure there's people angry when they find out what you do and how you help people uh, and that mm -hmm. you're excited about what you do that attack mm -hmm. you. I'm sure you must have people that say mean things to you. I mean, yeah, I mean, not so much, but I hear that it's strong for her and she's entitled to that. And that's great. Like, I don't really know how to, I'm, I'm certainly not going to defend it right. because it's something well, that works for me and I want her to feel validated in her experience. And I, I certainly am not going to take that away. Um, well, I can explain, I can explain that. I can explain why it's not adultery because <laughs> you, your, your partners are fully knowledgeable of the fact that this is the practice that you keep. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's adultery when I say, yeah, baby, I love you and I'm not with anybody else, mm -hmm. and then I go do it anyway. Right. That's yeah. adultery. Right. So, yeah. so I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with Bonnie's statement. Although I, I happen to agree probably more with Bonnie's lifestyle, it's the one I practice, I don't agree that that's still, uh, adultery at all. If, both, if you're both, all three or, or more, in Robert's case, nine, are, are, <laughs> are, are, are consenting, I have it, an yeah. idea. I want to get Robert to get a tattoo on his forehead that says poly. <laughs> I just want to, I want, to have a, I want him to have a poly tattoo. Right. <laughs> I mean, oh and, and, and it brings up a really good point because it's consensual non-monogamy. So everybody is, is yeah. in it. It's not, yeah, yeah. it's the adultery is like going behind someone's back right. and like breaking an agreement. Like this is no, it's like we are creating this, co-creating this. And this is our co-creation. So everybody is consciously on board. That's right. the difference. And like, right. they are different and they're both valid. Now in your experience, are you seeing more of the younger people, younger than all of us, that are more inclined to this type of relationship? Or are you seeing more people 55 plus that are like, you know what? We only got so much time on this earth. It's time to step it up. <laughs> The freaks come out at night. The freaks come out at night. It's interesting because I think I see all of them. Like there's not like a one pot, like one age population that I serve more than others. What's very common is I do get a lot of couples that have been married or in relationship for 10 plus, maybe 20 years. And they're ready for a change. Their kids are out of the house. They want something new. They want to explore something different. Um, or one person is like, you know, maybe they, well, not maybe, like sometimes there's infidelity. So they want to like clear some of that stuff up. Um, but also there is this, um, you know, people who have gotten divorced like once or twice 
and they can see that they're in certain patterns in their relationships and they want to change it and they're not really sure how to do it. They've heard of poly or they've heard of, you know, open relationships or something like that. And they're wanting to make a new, like take, like take a new step in a new kind of relationship where they feel like they're honoring more of themselves because when they were in that marriage that failed, they weren't honoring themselves. Wow. I have a, um, I'll borrow you. Want to, you go ahead. Real quick question. I was just wondering, are, are poly, I guess these, these relationships, are they always sexual or do sometimes some, you know, like a couple might want to have more of an emotional relationship with someone else? Cause in my mind, I think as far as one of the other reasons why I feel like this wouldn't fit for me too, is that that emotional connection with someone would be something I would want with that person, you know, on top of the whole sexual side too, but that emotional side is just, would be just as important to me too. Yeah, absolutely. that's a great question. And that's something that I see a lot in the people that I work with. So generally there is one, so imagine like a partnership of two. Generally there is one partner that is more interested in the physical side, like the sex side. It's like they're not interested in the emotional side. And then there's another partner that is more interested in the emotional side and they're not at all attached to the sex side. So you have these two very valid desires and yet those may come in conflict because the one person that wants to be more sexual with other people that like, you know, there's just this fear that comes up. And so each one has a different kind of fear, but it's along the same thing, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you can, so both partners can, can, can acknowledge that they're both feeling a level of insecurity. The stories may be different, but the insecurity is there. And so when we can meet on that baseline feeling of like, okay, yeah, like you're both feeling insecure for different reasons, or you're both feeling jealous for different reasons. Okay, what do we want to do with that? Right. Because then there's a shared reality. And so, and I get that, that emotional piece. And I think more often than not, like female bodies, like, you know, women, people that have more of a feminine energy um, will feel more drawn to the emotional. And like, yeah, like, my partner emotionally connecting with someone else is gonna like, it's gonna feel really tender. Right. And for my partner, like he may be more drawn sexually to somebody else. And so if I am gonna go off and be sexual with somebody else, that may trigger him. Cause right. it brings up all this stuff around, I'm not masculine enough or I'm not this enough. So we all have these versions of I'm not enough or whatever. And so it, yeah, it does come up. And I think sometimes, when people can talk about that, and then I can say, yeah, that's common. You're not the only ones. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, this is part of the territory. Do we want to talk about it, or do we not want to talk about it? Do you want to explore how to navigate that or not? Because when I can normalize some of this stuff, then people feel, oh, okay, I'm not the only one that experiences this. I'm like, no, you're not. And yeah. then we continue the conversation if they want to. Wow. So talk about mm -hmm. taking communication to a whole other level. <laughs> well, every, I mean, yeah, everyone, you know what, though? I mean, you, know, you, know, you say that, Barbara, but I think one of the things that I'm getting out of what you're saying is a thought that, as you were saying, it came to me, and that is, you know, you can have... I've been with partners before. Um, I, I, I've been married before to someone who never really got me to that place where I wanted to get my freak on. You know, like, I just... She never could go... And it will say there's times when you're lovemaking and there's times when you're, you're just doing it. Um, I don't think it, for me, as I look at this scenario, think that I can ever really have a partner where I'm doing that slow, intimate, lovemaking thing. I think I would give some of that away if I had the other person that I was shagging on the side because it was fast and raw and sex, sexual. And I don't know how you could do both with different people. I, I think... I would never have that one. I would have to give up that connection in some way. It would be, it would almost like I'd have to have two different personalities to do that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, Interesting. Well, well, you know, it's, um, as Daniel was, or was stating that, I was thinking about one of my friends who I just saw in uh, Florida and he's been married for over 20 years. Um, and he and his wife, they ventured out. So he's telling, he's literally just telling me this story. And he said that, they would go and they had agreements in place and it just really like he loves her she loves him they have a great relationship they communicate extremely well 
but occasionally they would go and they would bring someone in that they both agreed on or you know agreed to to bring into their relationship but you don't kind of like they had agreements in place where they he was saying i don't contact a person um without my spouse knowing that i contacted the person uh, he said that his i said man does your wife get jealous when you guys like get with other couples or like do all this he says my wife gets jealous when we're on the beach and i see a girl walk by and i'm looking at her in a way that makes her feel jealous but not mm. based on the agreements we have in place it, it was really interesting and i was all ears and i said so are you guys still doing that now and he goes no not anymore but you know we did it for about 18 years <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, Barbara, Bar Barbara, and I go, and Barbara puts different wigs on. <laughs> hey now, I want to see the blonde. I want to see the blonde wig on Barbara. <laughs> Listen, Barbara, Barbara as a blonde truck driver is badass. <laughs> hey, so hey, so we have about a good ten minutes. I have, uh, so we're gonna do like a little rapid thing with you, right? So we're gonna ask you some sure. questions, and we'll go okay. in order. But before we do that, can you briefly kind of just bring clarity to um, these words? Because I don't, I don't get the definition. Like, there's four of them that I have in front of me. I have polyamorous. Uh huh. Can you? Yeah. Is that, okay. What is that? Loving more than one person. So it's consensual, like where, where both parties or all parties are consenting to it. Okay. What is polygamy? No. Poly oh. Polygamy. <laughs> polygamy. <laughs> Polygamy. <laughs> That's where there's one male that has multiple wives. Yeah, one it's male. like the Mormon religion. That's different. Okay. Yeah. And what is polygyny, or is P O L Y G Y N Y? Okay. Polygamy. Polygamy. I think that's what that is. that's one. What that's one woman to multiple men. All right. So the opposite of what you just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then polypony. Did I say that right? Maybe polypony. P uh, polygony. Is there another word I'm missing here? <laughs> I'm, I'm, there might be. There's. I mean, people make up words that, all the time. Is that, is that is that P O N Y? Is that is that having multiple partners that are horses? Yeah, partners with all things. <laughs> Polly pony, I'm baby. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the last one. Is. I'm not sure what that last one. Is. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll reach out to you. But uh, let's start with Barbara. Okay. And we'll go Barbara, Daniel, me, and uh, let's see if we can get around three times, like three All times. Right. Okay. So what do you, what would uh, you say is the biggest misconception about polyamorous relationships? That it's all about the sex. People are doing it because they want to have sex. Wow. Okay. So you've been yeah. in a variety <laughs> of types of relationships before you practice this, and now you practice this what's the biggest thing that's missing the biggest thing that's missing oh yep. god maybe there's not enough time to explore everything i want to explore i don't know it's your answer i think yeah there's big things missing like my life feels so full yeah i feel complete okay wow um in the poly amorous world can I think legally you can't be married on paper, but is there like a marriage opportunity when you have like three people wanting to be together for life? I know that in Massachusetts, they Somerville, Massachusetts, they recently uh, recognized polyamorous relationships as something that they could do um, a legal partnership with. So I know that in some states and some countries it is recognized. Wow, Barbara? Okay, so between men and women, like if you took a poll of who you work with, um, who wants better sex more, the men or the women? Ah, uh, that it's, is a great question. It's not so much about gender, it's about upbringing. It's about how people were brought up. So I don't have like a fit, like I, I mean, I could say 50-50, but I don't really know because it's more about what their religious background is, what their cultural background is, how they were taught what relationship is. And if there was any trauma or abuse in their, in their childhood. There's lots of different factors with that. It's a great question. Your 
50 years old. You were raised the way you were, uh, went to church on Sunday, um, faded out while you were around 14, 15 from this religious thing, now practicing a polyamorous lifestyle. At 50 years old, you unexpectedly get pregnant. Do you raise your child polyamorous? Ooh. I would raise my child to be whoever they wanted to be as an individual. Mm-mm, mm-mm. That's cheating. No? Do you do you make your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old aware to witness ah. your polyamorous lifestyle, or do you shield them from that and wait till they're old enough to make that choice themselves? I would I know couples who have been who are I know parents who are poly that have children and they've always followed the children's questions and answered the talk, questions. I'm, talk, I'm talking about you. Yeah, so for me, that's a really great question. Um, I wouldn't want to keep them hit. Like it's, I think it's selective information when, the, when they're ready to hear it. That's the answer that comes to mind. So I'm not going to say right out of the womb, like this is like, I, I'm not really sure. I'd have to, that's a great question. I'm not really sure how to answer that. You're asking really good questions. That's why they bring me in. I'm the higher done. Wait, That's good. Yeah, I have to think about it. Put the baby. Yeah, and I don't want kids, so I'm not going to say put the baby in my arms. So I'm just going to say that. All right. In your yeah. personal opinion, okay. in your your experience working with couples, mm -hmm. would you recommend all relationships at least learn about this lifestyle and see if it's mm -hmm. a fit for them? I recommend everyone have as much information that they need about all different kinds of relationships to see what it is that they are most interested in as an individual. And if they're really drawn to exploring one style of relationship, that they have the kinds of conversations to get to know what that's like. Like in all, like let's say you have a, a man who's considered straight. Should he, uh -huh. you know, let his curiosity, you know, Get him on some website where he can date a guy. Like, help me out there. I mean, <laughs> don't, do it for, don't do it for. <laughs> yeah, why not? Like, absolutely. Like, I support people that have a free expression of who they are. Right. So, you know, so like, am I going to advocate and like try to put it on everybody? Like, no. And if it come, if the universe provides, you know, people with this term or this way of being in relationship, and it piques their interest, it's like explore that there's a lot you can learn about that it might be for you it might not be for you but you'll have more information and if it's not for you you'll know, you'll know how to have conversations with people that are doing it so that there's more you know more knowledge about it rather than more judgment all right okay <laughs> so all right so i'm thinking of couples like in long term as you you know you're getting older you're you know going to your golden years the, was it the twilight years do you find couples who are polyamorous they as they get older and like I said towards the end of their life do they go back to just one partner that's a great question I don't have anyone in that age bracket um like if I looked at myself and like considered like what my life might look like as I'm aging I could imagine it being more um like monogamish you know like I don't, I couldn't necessarily see myself going out with on multiple dates in a week because I think I would like to have that safety net, that home base, that like preserving my energy for my last few years. That's what comes to mind for me. Okay. Wow. Like keeping things simple. <laughs> I like simple because this is not a very simple lifestyle. Yeah, this is complicated. <laughs> get, that, get that planner out. Me too, man. I want to start a new movement for Robert. Gay Black Lives Matter. I want to start it now. I want to get it moving forward. I'm I'm proud of you, Robert. You're gonna step out of your shell now. That's impressive. Man. Step out of my shell. I'm, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to follow you, Daniel. I'm not quite following you. I feel you, brother. I feel All right. you, brother. Um, so Daniel, you have a last question for um, for Lori. Um, you know. Um, I grew up as a, as a, uh, a Catholic. Um, I became in 2002 a born again Christian. And, um, and this is no, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve. Um, in, in public, I say things about, if you want to know about my path, I can tell you as a 
as a former drug addict who was in really bad trouble, how I found God and, and how I went. I don't say this in any um, uh, um, combative way to you, but I'm going to pray for you, sister. I'm going to pray for oh, you, baby. I really am. Thank you. I love the yeah. prayers. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray for you. Well, you know, one Finish. of the things that I picked up from you in this entire conversation was that there was no judgment here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no. I think that's that's great to, and, and I love that because you know you you're gonna have way more people that are against even the idea of it um, mm -hmm. than you're gonna have that are for, and mm -hmm. and I just want to say thank you for making time to to share this because the one mm -hmm. thing I got out of hearing you talk and all of us actually share was is the importance of, of open communication with whoever you're in a relationship with. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think Dan, you kind of opened up with that that key point. Um, so that was that that was driven home for me. Mm -hmm. And so Absolutely. it can work for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. And I also think that there's a lot of people that are that are lost out there because they don't know who to talk to because there's so much like programming around this is a bad thing. And so it's nice to have like conversations with people that get it, you know, and, and I think just knowing that it's a thing is, is worth, you know, just like, it's like a guest, like invited to dinner, like you don't have to put it on your plate, but you know, it's, it's something that people do and it's not for everybody. And I think that that's okay too. All right. Well, on the drum roll, Barbara, are you uh, looking at changing the way you live your life? Are, did you yeah. learn so much that you're willing to give this a shot? No, I think I mean, I, I'm just, you know, but that's just like you said, it's like viscerally not for me. However, I will tell you this, I will say, I've also seen people in so-called, uh, you know, uh, exclusive relationships that are not so good either, you know, and doesn't mean just because you're on a, you know, you're in an exclusive relationship, great. I do love the fact that you just, like you said, Robert was saying, non-judgmental, you're all about that open communi communication and putting it out there um, mm -hmm. and being someone, or, or maybe it's multiple people uh, that can actually handle that and deal with mm -hmm. those emotions. I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned um, from just that, mm -hmm. that skill set and whether you choose to be polyamorous or not, mm -hmm. it's a lot to be um, benefited from just talking openly. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think the show went well. Daniel's now sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> best, best show ever. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to get him on something. Yeah. He was, trying, he was trying to pull me under the bus. What's yeah. Up? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lori, thank you. We have uh, we are making your information available for people who want to learn more about you. Reach out, find out more about your services. And we definitely, I would love to like have you back on. And awesome. Talk about this again. Yes. Um, it's yeah. I think it's fun. You know, I like to disrupt things a little bit too. <laughs> awesome. Uh, it was wonderful meeting y'all, and thank you so much. And yeah, keep keep in touch. I look forward to receiving the recording, and yeah, it'd be really really great to talk to y'all again. All right. Well, as we we always end it, Barbara, and as we share with people, our goal here is to help people get healthy, be healthy, and ultimately. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Thank you very much, Lori. We'll be in touch. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.